Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And on our panel tonight, we have the Conservative Party's only MP north of the border, who's been Secretary of State for Scotland since 2015, David Mundell. We have the former director of the human rights organization, Liberty, made a peer by Jeremy Corbyn, and now his shadow attorney general, Shami Chakrabarti. The deputy first minister of Scotland, who's been in the Scottish Parliament since it was created, John Swinney. The crime writer, who backed Scottish independence in 2014 and voted for Remain in the EU referendum, Val McDermid, and once head of media for the Liberal Democrats, now leading the free market think tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, and a Brexiteer, Mark Little. Good, and as always, from home or wherever you're watching this, Join the debate. Facebook's there, Twitter's there, text 83981 if you want to do it that way, and push the red button, you'll see what others are saying. So keep the debate going as the programme progresses. Let's have our first question from Leslie Turan, please. 62% of Scots voted against Brexit. Should Scots have the right to a second independence referendum? Should the Scots have the right to a second independence referendum because of voting to leave the EU? Shami Chakrabarti, as a non-Scot, what do you think? Um, well, obviously, I'm a non-Scot, so I'm not going to determine what, you know, what people in Scotland want for their, for their future. But I personally think that referenda in general can be very, very divisive moments in a society's life. We've seen that... <laughs> We, we saw that in Scotland, in my case from outside. Goodness me, we saw that. We saw that all over the United Kingdom. You know, the toxicity of that campaigning on both sides. Families split and not speaking over it. Communities divided over it. Are we really in the mood for yet another referendum? I'm not so sure. Val McDermott, what do you think? For a start, I don't entirely recognise your portrayal of what happened in Scotland during the last <laughs> decade. I, I personally know of no families that have been divided and don't speak to each other anymore. I have friends who are on the other side of the argument from me. We had many vigorous discussions and we are still friends. We still sit down and have a glass of wine. Uh, is, is that, what, is what that, is that on, what, on what, both what, referendums? Yes. Both what, on the EU one and on independence? Yeah, but principally in the, in the independence one, yeah. that's what I'm talking about here. Um, what we had was a media storm of whipping up a frenzy of hatred and anger that wasn't really reflected on the ground. Yes, there were extremists on both sides who were vile and repulsive and insulting and demeaning, but they were the tiny minority, the tiny vocal minority. But the overwhelming majority of people in this country were voting on something that they were passionate about, and not passionate about in a narrow, tart and shortbread way, but passionate about it for the future of this country going forward. But, Shami, you saw in, in England, presumably, you're talking about divisions on the EU referendum that separated and split families oh, absolutely. and friends. I mean, I've been told by friends they went through periods of not speaking to family members. Um, uh, we, we saw a spike in hate crime, certainly, yeah. um, um, south, of, south of the border um, after, the, uh, after the vote. Um, we, we lost a, a bright young Labour MP um, in, in a hate killing. Um, I, I do believe that sometimes in... In a con there's a constitutional moment and you have to have a referendum, but, but I don't think this should happen every year in a country or society's life. These are very blunt instruments. Yes, no, All in, right. out. I think there are lots of other issues that are very important now to, okay. to securing equality, justice, fairness, schools, hospitals yeah. All right. and Fine, so on. Fine, but we deal with the referendum <laughs> and Brexit. You say in, in the third row there, what do you think? I, I think the question really points to a significant change in uh, what, is, what is the situation in Scotland. Uh, the whole issue of whether we were better together in the UK and then, uh, you know, a, a short while after, 
We enter into a referendum to exit the EU. And I think the question that we have to face in addressing Scotland now is whether we're better in a Brexiting UK or whether we should have the opportunity to form our own destiny in the EU. And that's the question that we should be addressing. And what, what's your view? <clears throat> in, in my view, the, uh, uh, the way that the, uh, the Brexit situation has been handled, it seems to me that it's a, a, it's a drifting situation where no one really knows where we should be. Scotland has very decisively voted in favour of remaining in the EU, and that's where our destiny should be, and that's what we should be really addressing. We, Scotland has been let down by this situation, mm -hmm. and we need to speak up and well, argue it, for it, another reference. Quite a lot of other people have been let down in that sense as well. I mean, L London, London voted, London with, voted with uh, to remain to, like Scotland. It with doesn't with have respect an to London and other parts of England, they, yeah. uh, what we should, right. uh, shouldn't forget here is that Scotland is part of a union. Scotland is a country, London is a city, and there is a significant difference there. Okay, John Smini. <laughs> I suppose the question for you is, is, should Scots have the right to a second independence referendum? And if so, when would you have it? I think, for, for me, Scotland has a right to determine her own constitutional future, and that's a very basic point of self-determination. And I think the question that Leslie has highlighted is in the fact that she marshals the 62% support for Remain in Scotland reinforces the point that the gentleman has just made, that Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom very clearly are going in different directions in our thinking. And in that respect, I think people must... Uh, be free to decide what is to be the future of our country. And for our part, as a government, what we've tried to do since the referendum last, uh, last June is to chart a course where we can uh, res respond to the decisions that people in Scotland have taken, the fact that we've argued for a different course, and to try to find a way forward with the UK government that respects that. And so far, but, well, we've got absolutely nowhere on that particular but, question. But, but, and but, the idea... <laughs> Hold on a second. I, I, just, I can, just clarify I, this. Uh, the, the UK as a whole uh, voted to get out. Uh, what concessions do you want made to Scotland that would fit in with that decision that was made by the UK? Or are you actually saying we've got to get out of the UK? Well, what I'm saying is that... I mean, what a, compromise in a, are you looking well, for? Well, are you in, in, frightened in the, of having a referendum at the moment? In the, well, not in the slightest, but in the paper that the Scottish Government published in December set out an approach whereby Scotland could retain our participation within the single market through membership of the European Economic Area, and that would see us maintaining our membership of the United Kingdom. Mm. But Theresa May yeah. has slammed the door on that. She said, we're coming out of the single market and we're all coming out of the single market, despite the fact that even many of the Leave campaigners were saying during the EU referendum, you don't have to leave the single market. Okay, so, so when you're going to have the referendum, when you're going to, ha when you're going to, to leave? Brexit. Well, we'll pursue the negotiations we're having with the United Kingdom, but quite clearly we've, we've set out to the UK government, if that does not get us to a satisfactory conclusion, then the likelihood of a second independent re referendum is very likely indeed. Do you, do you agree with uh, your former leader that... Uh, the autumn of next year is the likely date for it. it well, obviously, we, we've got a negotiation. Just a simple question. We, we've got a negotiation. I know you've said that already. And you, we'll, is we'll it going to be what, as soon as we'll that? See, we'll see what that produces. But ultimately, we've got to look at the decisions the UK government take. And if we believe that's not producing a, a, an approach which will deliver for the people of Scotland, then we've got a right to take that okay. issue to the uh, uh, Hold on. David, David Mundell hasn't spoken. David Mundell, uh, the Prime Minister, said she wouldn't be triggering Article 50 until. There's a UK approach and objectives for negotiations. It doesn't sound as if there's much of a UK approach here in Scotland, does there? Well, I, I'm, I'm disappointed to, to hear what John Swinney's had to say because he knows that officials between the two governments are working all the time to look at how we can come to an agreed uh, position. I want us uh, to have an agreed position, and if we take the Scottish Government's document, which I regard as a serious contribution to uh, the debate, th that document sets out a whole range of areas where we're <coughs> actually in agreement, in agreement on areas like workers' rights, in the status of EU citizens, in relation to criminal justice and security. So there are a lot of areas in which we are in agreement. But my concern... So, the status, my concern, the status of EU citizens, where are you in agreement? You well, we, what you're going to do about we, it? We 
we want it's to... It's up for we, negotiation. We well, want, that, it's not up for negotiation. Well, you haven't said you guarantee... We, we well, want to ensure the status of EU citizens you in the UK. Well, and we want, on, and we want And we want to ensure the status... Listen, wait a minute, David. We want to ensure the status of British citizens in Europe. And that is a position on which I would have thought that we would be in agreement, John. It's EU citizens who have absolutely no idea where they stand and they're desperate for clarity. And your government's not delivered it. It's a very simple, simple question to deliver to you, to answer, David. I'm, I'm not going to be lectured by somebody who was found out for delaying an announcement about the funding of European students so that it could be made at your party conference so that more rather people could, than bring so that, certainty so that, to those so students. So, so, so don't that, lecture so me, more, so that, don't lecture so that, me on so that, playing politics right, with right, you right, 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 I think the audience watching, and indeed this audience here, would probably prefer it if you didn't play politics because it's too serious for that. It's very exactly. serious. So can I, can I just ask you, where is the guarantee that the rights of EU citizens in the UK will be maintained? You haven't said that. What, you said it's up for negotiation. It depends what, on what happens in Europe. What the Prime Minister has set out is that it is a priority for her to achieve uh, that situation. We want to be able to guarantee the rights of EU citizens, right. just as we want we to can. be able we to guarantee the rights of UK citizens who are in Europe. OK, and, and, and on the issue of a referendum, if the SNP decide to go for a referendum, you're in favour of them having a referendum? Well, my belief is and I've said that many times, of course, there could be another independence referendum. The question is, that should there be another independence referendum? And I am quite clear that the answer to that is decisively no. We've had... <laughs> we've had... We've had, an we've had an independence... We had an independence referendum in 2014. I don't quite share uh, Val's uh, perspective on it, although I do welcome the fact that we had such an <coughs> overwhelming turnout in that referendum. There was a decisive result in that referendum and now it is absolutely clear that the people of Scotland do not want a second referendum. And if John is genuinely... If, if John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon are genuinely listening to the people of Scotland on their opinions about a referendum, they would take it off the table now. All right, so... All right, I get, I, now, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to, I just want to check one thing with you. Um, the words of senior figure in the Cabinet, Michael Fallon, the Defence Secretary, when asked about this, whether there might be another, whether Westminster would allow, that was the words, another said, no, forget it. Is that your view? My view, is that, my, allow, my, my, my view is that the SNP should forget about having another referendum. Uh, yeah. it, 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 you know, Last, last, last... Hang on, that, was, uh, that wasn't my question. My question was whether you agree with Michael Fallon. If, Sc my... if, if the SNP asks for one, if the Scottish Parliament asks for one, you will say, no, forget it, like he the says. The position, and uh, John Swinney knows this, is that uh, okay. the Westminster Parliament would have to agree because that, that is where the responsibility for the referendum lies. We haven't received a okay. request to have another referendum, and I don't believe we should. We right. must continue to argue that we should not have another referendum. Right. OK, fine. Now, Mark, I'm going to bring you in, but I'd like you just to hear from other members of our audience here, because there are a lot of hands up. Let's just hear just your views. The, the woman there in the, thir in the third row. Um, a lot of things have changed since that first referendum. Um, <laughs> first day, uh, a lot of people voted no because we were told our EU membership would be under threat. Yeah. Um, also, I don't agree with the fact that you said it divided a country. That referendum sparked an interest in politics with a lot of young people. Absolutely. And if you'd ever been to a rally in George Square, you'd have seen there were thousands of people there campaigning peacefully. But if you watched the BBC News, you'd have never seen that because he didn't report it. And what's your... What's your... What's your, view, what's your view about another referendum? You're in favour? Uh, I'm in favour. And yeah. you sit up there in the, in, in the shirt. Oh, you, of course you're in a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I bet my shirt on it. But you, there you are, yes, you. In, I thought it was pink, but it's white, I think. Thank you. That's Sha right. Sha Shami hit, hit the nail on the head when she said there's lots of other issues that have to be addressed in this country. Uh, however, that's exactly why there should be a second referendum. There's lots of issues in Scotland that have to be addressed, and we're not being represented by the people in, in Westminster. <laughs> so that's the reason why we made, 
we may have some difficult times and a short space of time with another referendum and there'll be some debate. But as Val said, we'll all come back to be friends. I've got friends on the other side of the fence as well, but we're still friends. At the end of the day, there's a bigger picture to look at here. We have things to address, problems to overcome, and we can only do that if we've got control of our own destiny in this okay. country. Mark, Mark Littleman. Look, I think the lady nailed it in the third row over there. Uh, almost the 2014 decision is moot because the constitutional framework that you understood prevailed then has changed enormously. In just over two years' time, the uh, Westminster government will take us out of the European Union because, in aggregate, English votes and Welsh votes out-trump Scottish votes. The vote here was overwhelmingly to remain. Things have changed. I think that is a sensible reason to revisit this decision. The constitutional basis upon which you voted in 2014 has altered markedly. If you now wish to be... If you now wish to be a member of the European Union, you will have to leave the United Kingdom. That is the exact opposite of what was prevailing in 2014. Now, you've probably had, since the Act of Union of 1706, far too many people like me telling you what you should do. So I'm not going to tell you what you should do, but I hope you'll take a little bit of friendly advice. I think this is a great country. This is the country of Adam Smith, David Hume, David Livingston, J.K. Rowling, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. Val McDermott. Val McDermott. Heroes, heroes all. Heroes all. And you have the national income of a country like Portugal. You have the population of a country like Slovakia or Finland. I see no reason whatsoever why Scotland can't take its own place uh, okay. as a proud, independent <laughs> nation. So, who, who, who shouted out, no, you haven't here? I'd like to go to... Was you? Yes, you, sir. Um, the 62% who voted remain is yesterday's news. It was yesterday's news on the 24th of June last year. All those Labour voters, Conservative voters, Liberal Democrat voters, all the people who were fr frightened into uh, voting remain, these are most of the people also who voted no to breaking up the United Kingdom. And if they thought today that their votes were going to be hijacked as an excuse, mm -hmm. as a fundamental change for another Scottish referendum, they must rue the day that they ever voted Remain. OK. <laughs> All right, let's just go... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll stick with this, but Louise White, let's just have your question, Louise, cos that, that rather adds to the dimensions of what we're talking about. Louise White. Um, why do the SNP want to reclaim powers from Westminster only to hand them over to Brussels? So, um, Mark Littlewood. Well, it's a strange Brief, one. if you would, on this one. It, it, it is a strange one. I mean, I think if you do want to assert your independence, it would be a little odd to throw off the dominance of the Westminster Parliament and then to immediately reshackle yourself to the European Union. But there are some differences. It, the Westminster Parliament controls a considerable degree more of your tax and spending than the European Union does. The European Union, were you to leave the UK and rejoin, would control a large amount of your regulation, but not as much of your tax and spending. A good number of countries, it wouldn't be my advice to John Swinney or the SNP, but a good number of countries about the size of Scotland are, I think, broadly independent countries and have decided to be members of the European Fine. Union. Okay. That is an option open All right. So to you, you see no conflict. Val, what do you think? Well, I think that while the decision to go into this rock-hard Brexit may be the trigger for us to move towards another referendum, it won't be what their referendum is actually about. Because at this point, we can't predict what the EU is going to be like in 18 months, yeah. two years' time. Mm -hmm. The EU is clearly in a state of flux at the moment. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen in the French elections. We don't know if Mrs Merkel will continue to be German Chancellor. We cannot know what it will be like at the point where, if there is going to be another referendum, that happens. So that's a moot point at the moment. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what we're going to be heading into in two years' time, but ultimately it is about the future of Scotland and the decisions that we make knowing what the, the options are, instead of being told what the options are going to be and then discovering that we've been lied to. And you, sir, in the, in the red tie. Val is absolutely right. If you think about it, a lot of Europeans don't want to stay in the European Union. What on earth are we doing joining it? They all want to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, there's, there's 
two reasons that directly answer the lady's question. Uh, there are a whole range of independent countries have decided voluntarily to work together as part of the European Union. And some of them are small countries like Scotland, other, uh, others of them are larger countries. But they all decide in their common interest to work together for mutual uh, benefit and for mutual uh, progress. And the second reason is that if we're part of the European Union, we have access to a market of 500 million people, which is 10 times the market of the United Kingdom. It is a significant opportunity, which is now going to be more difficult for us to access because okay. of the decision to leave the European Union. So it's about making sure that we protect and assert the national interest of Scotland, which can be best served by working with other countries okay. for mutual benefit. Uh, David, David Mundell, do you see a, a conflict between well, seeking well, independence I, and then I, remaining? I'm always staggered. Or going I, back I, into I, the EU, whatever I, it would be. I'm always staggered when the SNP make this point about uh, the, the European market and how important it is to Scotland. The market in the rest of the UK is worth four mm. times as much <laughs> as all 27 other countries. And it just seems to be capable of being disregarded as if it was a mere nothing. And it, if, it, if barriers are to be created between Scotland and the rest of the UK, that doesn't seem to matter. The logic doesn't stack up. But I'm, I'm grateful for John Swinney tonight clarifying that the SNP is in favour of EU uh, membership because there's been some uh, doubt lately because of some suggestion that it wouldn't actually be full EU membership because, of course, they have to take into account the 500 thousand of their supporters who voted to leave the EU and this idea that everyone in Scotland voted to remain although I did well, is completely <coughs> false well but the, pro the problem the, the, the problem the problem with all of that David is that the wishes of the people of Scotland were clearly expressed in the point that was made by the first question of where 62 percent voted in favor of remaining in the United of in the, the United European Union. Kingdom and remaining also, in the, the key, EU John, and the key not point, and the key, Scotland and the key democratic point David is that in resolving this you're the only one that's voted for Brexit in the United Kingdom Parliament from Scotland everyone else from Scotland has voted not to exit the European Union and that's a democratic uh, absurdity uh, for the people of Scotland that is your complete disrespect for the one million people in Scotland who voted to leave the EU. I well, didn't what, agree with them, but I respected them. But what about your lack of respect for the 62%, the overwhelming majority of our citizens, and the 58 of the 59 mm. Scottish MPs mm. that voted to, not to trigger Article and the 50 two million as is the democratic people, John, of those who individuals. voted to remain so you, in you, the United to, Kingdom. So, da David Mundell, you're... Your view is that despite the fact that an overwhelming majority of Scotland wanted to stay in the EU, given that the UK voted Brexit, they better stick with the UK. That's it, it, in it, the summary, it, is your I, view. I believe that the arguments for Scotland remaining part of the United Kingdom are as strong are today stronger than as the they EU were argument. when we voted to remain in 2014. Great. You say with that. Let's look uh, about the referendum and that, and then we'll move on to another question. You say with spectacles well, on, John, and I've got to you in the pink shirt there, yes. An SNP supporter, aren't you? Now, we had a vote referendum on independence, and we lost that. So we moved on to Brexit, which the country voted, which we are part of. We're part of Britain. The country voted out. We're out. I want to come out. I want to come out of the European Union. No single markets, no nothing. Okay. And, 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 and you, sir, in the, in the pink shirt. And then, Shami, I'll come to you. I just generally think that um, wouldn't it be better if we got our independence? We're not going to be able to stay in the EU by the time a referendum came about. Wouldn't it be a better position from a Scotland-centric point of view to be able to make choices about an ever-changing Europe at the time, as opposed to deciding now we're in, we're out, and campaigning on that? In, in, in or out of, of the UK? Of the EU. Of the oh, no, EU? I'm, totally for independence, I think that puts us in a position to actually make decisions for ourselves and for our children. So you go, you, you yeah. leave, <coughs> you'd leave, you'd leave the UK now, the in Brexit effect, if you could. The Brexit campaign never yes. gave me any information at all with which to make a valuable choice, a con an informed choice about Brexit. I just ended up confused. I'm concerned about all sorts of things, but Brexit did nothing for my confusion. Sh Sh Shami Chakrabarti. I, think I, I am. Yeah. Researching all the time. 
Jenny. Yeah, I, I respect these long-term debates about nationhood that have happened in the UK, they happen in Scotland, <laughs> but I think the immediate question, the immediate question is what kind of Brexit there is going to be for the UK. United Kingdom as it is currently constituted and we can be round with each other about in out when that decision has been made or we can be holding Mrs May and her government to account There's to make be a hard sure Brexit. well I don't Labour's think Labour's done so well, well on that so far well, you've opened well, 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 well actually well you've opened well, 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 you've, you've given them a blank cheque you've actually, given the Conservative no, government a blank cheque that's what you've done we have not given them a blank cheque they have had to they are going to have to publish a white paper they're going to have to report back to Parliament and you have got you have colleagues in Parliament yeah, exactly. that no doubt you have faith and many, in. And look at, look at in, and in, the, in the bill that went through the House of Commons, not a single amendment from any party was true. accepted by the UK and government. And the Labour week, Party voted at, st week, at the sir, final stage, you, which sir. opened up, opened up the floodgates week, for the Tories to do what they want. next week... All right, let's hear about next week in next the House week, of Lords. Next week, the bill is coming to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords is very differently composed to the House of Commons. Undemocratic. Yes, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. However, however, this this debate was supposed to be about parliamentary sovereignty, and there is an opportunity in the Lords to ensure that the government is held to account during these negotiations. Okay, what are you going for in the Lords? As a Labour, a new Labour baroness, what are you going for? The rolling of the R is delightful. Um, <laughs> and not a tiny bit sarcastic. Um, how dare I, how dare I take my place at the table as well. Um, what, what we need are greater safeguards about reporting. The government has said that they will report back to Parliament, so surely they will have no problem with, a, with agreeing to amendments in the legislation itself about reporting back to Parliament. And I think it's also crucial that we fight for an amendment to the legislation to guarantee the rights of people who have lived and worked and formed families in this country over many years as a fundamental human rights issue, they should be allowed to remain. But, Jimmy, are you saying that you will, are you saying that you will be able in the House of Lords to get the process of negotiation checked as it goes along, that, that, is, there, will be, that there will be a vote as it goes I along. I believe that, you that, won't that, give is a... the, that is the ambition of many peers of different parties and of no party. That is the <coughs> opportunity, that is the ambition of many people mm. in the weeks ahead. I didn't mean to insult Stop you by calling you Baroness, I just love the word Baroness. Ah. You have every right to be a Baroness. You're very kind, David. Well, you don't need my permission, but I just wanted to make it clear that I wasn't... Really? I, it wasn't an innuendo. Right, now, come on, let's get back to the subject. The woman there in the centre there, yes. Yes, you. I've got a message for David Mundell. I've just returned from Paris from the rugby, and I was with um, people from Scotland, people from your constituency, farmers from Langham, farmers who, who voted to stay in the UK and uh, voted no the last time. You could have knocked me down with a feather when they all said that they, were good, they would vote this time for independence, that if we had another <laughs> referendum. They are dying okay. in the world conservative and, farmers. And, and, and the woman here, and then I go to, to you there, and then to you. Yes, and then we'll move on. One thing that seems to be um, banded around in the Brexit debate all the time is this idea of respecting the democratic will of the people. Whether that be the Remainers need to sort of be quiet and get on with it, or the Labour MPs having to vote with Jeremy Corbyn on the, in the bill. But, and David Mundell, you um, yourself admitted that you voted Remain, yet you voted in the Houses of Commons to go through with the Brexit bill. So, by... Um, uh, not, not um, adhering to listen to the 60 percent, 60 odd percent of Scots who did vote to remain in the UK. You are fundamentally disrespecting their democratic voice. I absolutely disagree. With that perspective, as a Democrat, we had a referendum in Scotland. The decision was to remain in the United Kingdom. Yep. If Scotland had voted to leave the United Kingdom, I would have respected that result and I would have done everything I could to have made it a success. The United Kingdom as a whole voted to leave the EU. I respect that result and I'm doing everything that I can to make it a success for Scotland and the rest of the uh, but, UK. But, but, no, but, 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 no. Very brief. Very brief. Very brief. Oh, oh. 
it's, it's always been my understanding that we live in a representative democracy. So is it not therefore your obligation to represent the views of your constituents rather than the views of your party leader? Right. Well, uh, I mean, right. We're not going to get a constitutional debate. A, de a, a, a representative democracy means your representative decides, and then in five years' time, you decide whether you want that person to be your okay, representative let's not get or into not. Burkin, let's not get into Burkin territory here. Let's have a, a comment from you, sir. Comment from you. We have one or two other comments, and then we'll move on. Yes. Well, David is talking about we need to respect those that voted to leave the EU and Scotland. Well, David, what about respecting the? 45% of people in Scotland that voted to leave the UK. We see English votes for English laws brought into Westminster. So how far can then the rest of the UK determine Scotland's future? And also uh, on our Labour Lords uh, point about uh, the violence and the segregation we, in the first independence referendum that we had, as an English person, Born there, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. Scot Scot Scotland's home to me, it always will be. I didn't experience any segregation. I've right. got English All family right. down south and they you, were pleased you, that we voted for independence. Okay. The, the woman in the second row there, thank you for that. Just some comments, please, and then I think we must move on to other questions. We voted to stay in the United Kingdom. Then we voted as a national, not as a Scottish region or country. We voted nationally in the EU referendum and the vote was to leave and you just have to accept that whether you like it or not. Okay. Okay. Andrew, yes, the, the woman there behind you, sorry. Yes, the woman there. It's to David Mundell. Can we push you? No, don't ask him a question, just <laughs> say <laughs> your view. So I think, he goes um, on. I don't know if other people are extremely concerned about the, um, the amount that the NHS relies on in terms of skilled EU workers to staff our okay. chronically underrepresented, right. understaffed. The point made. And the man there in the blue pullover there, I know everybody wants to speak on this subject and I wish we could go on with it, but you, sir. I think it's important to note that in terms of gross numbers, significantly more people voted to stay in the United Kingdom than voted to remain in the European Union. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. <laughs> and we've seen since the Brexit vote that the polls haven't shifted significantly to suggest that there's a significant groundswell. There might have been switchers, but the overall numbers seem to have stayed relatively still in Scotland in terms of who supports uh, leaving the United Kingdom and remaining in the United Kingdom. And I think what will be interesting, and in the point uh, directed to John Swinney originally, about uh, the European Union, one of the key rules for joining the European Union is that your deficit can't exceed 3% of GDP. Scotland's currently is at 9.5%. Yeah. How do you propose to address that? So your, that? your idea is that people... <laughs> your, your people who voted remain should just grit their teeth and bear it, really, is what you're saying? Not necessarily. I think we have to work... That's one of the problems, actually, of referendums. They polarise people into simplistic yep. choices to very Absolutely. complex questions. Absolutely. I think we have to move away from this idea of it's a yes or no, or remain or leave. Absolutely. We have to have a much more intelligent discussion, because yep. our country deserves a more intelligent discussion about yep. it. Good. OK. Um, let's, let's go on to some other questions, because we're halfway through the programme. We've got uh, quite a lot of questions to come. <laughs> <laughs> Just to say, we're going to be in Stoke-on-Trent next week, and that, of course, is the night of the by-election at Stoke-on-Trent, and uh, the week after that, we're going to be in Bedford. So if you can come to Stoke-on-Trent or to Bedford, on the screen there is the email address and also our telephone number. You can call us and uh, apply to come. I'll give the details again at the end. Jason Smeal, please. Should the Scottish Government adopt the education reforms seen in England in order to improve falling attainment levels? This is a, yes, the question is about a report that uh, Scottish pupils are trailing behind the performance of able pupils in England in most subject areas, according to the Sutton Trust. So should you adopt reforms seen in England? Uh, Val? Well, Scotland used to have an education system that was the pride of the world. Um, it was an education system that allowed somebody like me from a working class background to go to Oxford University. Um, I think that uh, in many respects the Scottish Government has let down Scottish children in recent years. We do have a... <laughs> we do have a serious problem uh, with reaching educational attainments that we would all like to see. I think steps are being taken to improve that situation, but I'm not necessarily uh, convinced that going the same way of the English curriculum is the way to go. What I would like to see is a curriculum that encourages children to be curious, 
to learn because they want to learn. And that is not just about the forcing down a narrow curriculum path that we see in England. So I would like to see us explore, perhaps in some respects, a more traditional approach to learning, um, but that allows us to, to reassert ourselves as one of the leaders in education in the world. Which you had a reputation for being. Yes, we did. This, uh, so this line about trailing behind the performance of able pupils in England, you don't entirely agree that that's the right way of measuring well, educational, it's, 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 educational uh, success or ability? I don't know because I'm not an educationalist. Right. Uh, so I don't know the measures that are used. But I do think that we do need to improve our attainment and I think that the way to do it is not necessarily the way they have followed in England because that, I have a son who's at school in England and I think their focus is very narrowly curriculum based. Um, right. And it doesn't encourage people to think outside those narrow tram lines of we have to follow the curriculum, we have to do exactly what we have to do to get our GCSEs, to get our A-levels. What I would like to see is a system that encourages people to be curious, that encourages children to want to find out more. Okay. And that certainly was what I experienced as a child at school in Scotland. Okay. Uh, John Swinney, you're Education Secretary, obviously, here in Scotland, and you'll have read this stuff from the Sutton Trust that uh, bright Scottish people are falling behind, and also the... OECD report that Scottish performance in maths and reading and science is declining. What's the, uh, what's the, what's the, what's the action you should take? Well, is it to follow the reforms that have happened in England or look at them and see whether they work? Well, the first, th the first thing to do, David, is to acknowledge that we've got to improve performance in Scottish education. And I'm not going to sit here and say that there's not an issue that has to be addressed. And I think it, openly and, and, and honestly confronting that issue is my absolute priority and the First Minister has appointed me to lead that process in the Scottish Government and I've been um, doing that for the last nine months or so and I'm absolutely determined to make sure that we succeed in that respect. Uh, Val McDermott is correct that we need for the modern world to have a curriculum that enables young people to be curious and investigative because they're going to have to deal with an ever-changing world and if we look at the pace of change in the last 10 years in our society it's been a much more dramatic and aggressive piece of change than it was in the first 10 years yeah, of my life, for example. But do you accept there's been this slippage in it, well, performance I, I, in Scotland? I accept, I accept there's been, the data says that, uh, David, the, the PISA statistics that came out uh, before the turn of the year, uh, that's the OECD statistics you referred to, um, they indicate that fall in performance. But they were, that information was gathered in 2015, and since then the Scottish Government has taken a number of steps to improve the performance of Scottish education and just last, uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, I put over £120 million directly into schools to give head teachers much more control over the allocation of resources to strengthen, to make choices about what will strengthen educational performance okay. for individual J young people. But this just, what, ask, I, just make it to Jason, Jason you, you suggested that they should adopt the, uh, British, the English system. Do you, do you think that is the right answer? Is that what you're... Ex well, I mean, from what I gather, the free schools in England seem to have had some good results, especially in terms of improving attainment in kind of economically deprived areas. And John Swinney said, after the most recent PISA figures came out, that we need radical change in Scottish education. So what is that radical change? OK, well, sure, uh, 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 Mark Littlewood, let's just... I'll come back to you, John, but sure. Mark Littlewood. Uh, I think the radical reform you need is for politicians to get out of the curriculum altogether. Uh, the curriculum that needs to be set by teachers. If you are going to have a curriculum, make it one sentence long. Schools will teach maths, English, history and science. Full stop. Uh, the problem that we've got into, I think, both in Scotland and in England is being too prescriptive and making education a political football. John's got one hell of a task on his hands to improve education in Scotland. I'm glad he's admitted that the numbers are disappointing, even with those south of the border. But I would say don't necessarily adopt the English system. Adopt the Swedish system. Actually, the Swedes have been considerably more radical in allowing freedom in schools than we have in England. They've actually allowed some schools to be running on a for-profit basis. And that has actually brought in schools particularly to the underprivileged areas. You'll find in England that the free schools, typically, it's a broad brush analysis, are in the leafy suburbs with rich middle class parents. You're not finding so many of them actually popping up in deprived inner city areas. I'd say take the Swedish system. If you embrace that in Scotland, I think you'd find your PISA statistics actually improving over the next five years. Okay. Uh, so go for more freedom for the teachers, allow teachers to teach, allow headmasters to set the curriculum, 
And, uh, right. whilst John Swinney may be there. a well-intentioned man, yeah. frankly, getting politicians out of the way is the best way to get, right. get the best you, results. You said in blue there. Uh, can I say that the current Scottish Government has recently reformed the curriculum for, the curriculum for Excellence, but it has resulted in no substantial change to the current education system. We are still fully based on assessment-driven uh, criteria, and it hasn't really helped. Are you a so teacher to... yourself? Or are you... uh, I'm not a teacher, but I'm from a family of teachers. So, All right. Um... <laughs> David, David Mandel, what do you make of the argument? I find the most shocking statistic, not the comparison between Scotland and England, but the comparison that if you are a bright child living in a poorer area in Scotland, you are two years behind mm. the same child living in a more affluent area. And I think that is a shocking indictment of the SNP's 10 years in charge of education in Scotland. Because that is, that, that is... That is the reality. The SNP have been responsible for education in Scotland for 10 years. No interference from West Westminster, fully devolved. And I see that the fundamental problem is, despite John's uh, very plausible commitments, despite the fact that Nicola Sturgeon said last week in the Scottish Parliament education was her absolute focus. It's quite clear, even from the discussion tonight, it isn't. The absolute focus is independence. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I think it's actually quite incredible that you can come on this programme as the only elected, singly elected Conservative politician and talk about economic, economically driven education, given the, the wasteland that's been created by the Conservatives and neoliberalism <laughs> for the last 20 or 30 years. That's where the problem started. Shami Sh Shakrabarti. Um, I agree, of course, with everything that's been said about how troubling it is if Scottish children and, and the poorest in particular are falling so behind. But I'm not going to sit here and say it's all milk and honey south of the border either. Um, I, I agree with lots of what Mark said about political footballs and how that's been going on in the education system for years. I agree with what Val said about over-testing, over-prescription, where is the joy of learning and curiosity? But I think most of all I am worried about the relationship between inequality mm. and educational opportunity. You cannot separate these things, <laughs> right? If a, if a child hasn't had breakfast, if a child has no books at home, how, how do you expect to have the most amazing educational opportunity? These things go hand in hand, and, and, and austerity is a massive problem, and inequality is a massive problem all over the United Kingdom. All right, in here, and then John Abbeef. Yes. Um, I find the idea that seeing that there's been no interference from Westminster is just a complete farce because our budget has been cut and it can, is continually being cut by Westminster. That, that is, that, yes. Let's just get the facts on the table. That, that is just, I'm afraid, completely incorrect. But the budget has been cut. The the bu no, the, the, bu the budget has... The budget relatively has, the more budget than... Has, the, per head, the, it's relatively the, more the than Scottish it is The Scottish Government England. has uh, received more than they anticipated in the current uh, financial has year. It, has it, it dropped or risen? It, ha it has risen. The amount of money that the Scottish Government has received has risen. The Scottish Government recently found hundreds of millions of pounds to do a deal with the Greens uh, uh, to okay. get their budget through. So there okay. is money if the Scottish okay. Government wants to right. allocate it. All right. I'll take one more. Look, look, one more, then I'll come to you, John. Yes. Um, Brief point, if you would. OK. I, I was a teacher for 37 years, a maths teacher, and in that time I saw children going from a stage where they came up from primary school they were very numerate to recent years. I only retired in October and I was shocked at how the children coming up from primary school, they had no number bonds, they didn't know their tables, they knew nothing because of Curriculum for Excellence. And that has been the biggest negative that we've had so far in Scotland. And you only Just have to in look... A, in a nutshell, what, you, what, what, you, what, ha <coughs> what has happened in your 20-odd years teaching, whatever it was 37. you said, 37. <laughs> what, what is it that's happened? We, we moved away from basic numeracy and basic skills, which if you don't have them, you can't build in anything to teach children maths. Even at university level, if you don't understand fractions, you won't be able to do anything. Okay. You know, it's so just the traditional that the education fundamentals is, are, right. are not being taught because children are being allowed to explore and boxes are ticked, and, but nothing is reinforced and nothing is learned okay. to the same extent. Right. And that's not all schools, but quite a lot all of right. them. John Spinney, uh, uh,
it's not fair as Education Secretary to ask you to be too brief, but if you can just summarise, you've heard a lot of yeah. complaints and points, yeah. and particularly about the amount of money it had to spend and all the rest yeah. of it. Just okay. Well, the, the first thing is that on the question of numeracy, David Mundell has let himself down because the Scottish go Government's budget has been cut dramatically since the yes. Conservatives came to power. That, has he forgotten about austerity? The second, the, second, the, the second point is about uh, is Shami's point about inequality. And at the heart of the agenda that we are taking forward is the need to close that attainment gap, which has persisted in Scottish education for all of my adult life. It was there when I was a, a school pupil in Scotland, and it remains. And we've set a very ambitious target that in the course of this parliamentary term, we will make significant progress towards closing that gap uh, over the course of the next 10 years. And the final point I'd say is that the curriculum in Scotland it was changed, yes, it was changed in the early part of, uh, of this century after a big national debate involving many educationalists. But at the heart of the curriculum, to reassure the lady in the second row there, is literacy and numeracy and the health and well-being of our young people. And we must make sure they are all equipped with those foundations to make sure they can take their lives forward in an effective and way. We, we, have, right. to, okay, we have to no, focus uh, on that. All right, thank yeah. you. We must go on to another question because we have a quarter of an hour and I'd like to get a couple more questions in, if I can, because <laughs> I try to satisfy the demand for answers. Barbara Pauly, Barbara Pauly, please, your question. Should the UK follow Trump's lead and treat Russia as an ally rather than an enemy? Should, uh, if that is what uh, Donald Trump as president is doing, uh, treating Russia as an ally instead of an enemy, Mark Littlewood. I don't think that is what Donald Trump is doing. I think it's nearly impossible to work out what the hell Donald Trump is doing, actually. It seems to be complete chaos in the Oval Office. My, my biggest fear about him is not that he's a sexist or a racist or a fascist or something else that would offend my liberal sensibilities. It's that it's just chaos in the White House at the moment. So I don't think we should treat Vladimir Putin as an ally. But we should engage with Russia. I mean, back in the day, we dealt with Joseph Stalin to win the Second World War. We certainly dealt with the mass-murdering Leonid Brezhnev when he was running the Soviet Union. We have to deal with the world as it is, not with the world as we would like it to be. And that means lines of communication to Putin, uh, even for those of you who can't bear the new leader of the free world, lines of communication from the United Kingdom to Trump, are absolutely vital. Don't embrace Vladimir Putin, but recognise that in the dangerous world in which we live, we have to do business. And embrace Donald Trump? <laughs> I, I don't think we need to embrace Donald Trump. I don't think we need to embrace Donald Trump either. But if this country, or even if the United Kingdom splits into two, believes that we can go round not recognising that Vladimir right. Putin is an important part of the state, and not recognising that Donald Trump is, then I'm afraid our influence, be it English, Scottish or British, is going to wither. The, we the, have to keep lines of communication and decent relationships with these people, however, however unpleasant you find them. Val McDermott. <laughs> if, if indeed Trump uh, is treating Russia as a potential ally instead of an enemy, whatever that may well, be. Well, I, I, I do agree with Mark that I don't think any of us has the faintest idea of what Donald Trump is doing from one day to the next. I'm not sure how much he sense does. he has. He himself what he's going said, to do. I, I have nothing to do with today in his press conference. I have nothing to do with Russia. I have no deals there. I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But his, his, uh, his, his people certainly had dealings with Russia before he was elected, and um, the, the, the promise to remove sanctions from Russia is not something that you would do without there being some kind of quid pro quo, I feel, in the world of real politic. But to answer the question, uh, I, I, think, I think Mark's right. We do need to, we do, we do need to acknowledge that, that these people are there, they're, they're in power. But we do not embrace them as, as friends and allies when... Uh, they, they completely eviscerate any pretense of human rights in their country when they treat uh, their own people in ways that we would not allow to happen within our borders. Uh, so I think we need to keep those lines of communication open, but we must always make it clear what our position is, particularly in relation to human rights and the way you treat your <coughs> own population. OK. No, no, not there. You, no. In the back row. Yes. I find any suggestion that we embrace Trump in any way abhorrent um, due to this ban that he has had, um, we have Muslim citizens of our own and I imagine that they must feel 
um, insulted and offended that Theresa May went over there and played happy families with Trump when he's quite clearly been anti-Muslim in a way that is reminiscent of Hitler, but just with a different demographic. Shami Shakrabarti. Well, a question that begins, should we follow President Trump's lead, is it, not a question that I'm going to answer with a yes. <laughs> Uh, however, I think both Val and Mark had a point about negotiating with people, um, but I think sometimes one needs to negotiate not from a position of having your hand held or patted in the Oval Office, but from a, a position of dignity and strength. And that would have to be the case with, with both of these men to some extent. And it, 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 you said, Mark, that, um, that it's, you know, that Trump being a racist or a fascist or a misogynist might offend your liberal sensitivities. It's not my liberal sensitivities that it offends, it's my human sensitivities. And I think we should, mm. we should all share those. And, um, and those sensitivities are similarly offended by Mr Putin with his attitudes to women and gay people. And but stuff. you don't consider either of them as bad as Hitler, do you? I mean, th there's a lot of human rights abuse I, in the I, world, but we've got to put it in some kind of order. My um, recent experience is that it's not a great idea to be comparing people to Hitler. It's, it's rarely helpful in contemporary conversation. Just compare them to the other 250 leaders Look, on the planet. I, 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 I don't need there's to a lot do, of bad guys out there. I don't need to do that. I think the point is well made that it's a crazy world at the moment. But, and we, do have to engage, we do have to engage with Mr Trump and Mr Putin. But you were critical, unless I misheard you, yeah. of um, the Prime Minister's visit to Donald Trump. You said it, it ought to be conducted visit. with dignity. I You're suggesting I, it was undignified. I think it was undignified. Not that, not that she went. I think it was really important that she went. Um, but I think that uh, the iconography of her having her hand held and patted by the... Pre pre well, it was a bad photo op. Oh. It was a really bad da look. David Mundell. And I wouldn't like to see it with Putin either. <laughs> I'm absolutely clear that, that we can't have a business-as-usual relationship with Russia, uh, certainly as uh, it currently conducts itself. Uh, we have to be very, very clear uh, about that. Russia's behaviour in the Ukraine, Russia's behaviour even currently in Syria is totally unacceptable, and we have to make uh, that point repeatedly. But we do have to engage with Russia. Mm -hmm. there, is no, uh, there is no doubt about that. And, you know, some of the most dangerous times in our world have been when there hasn't been any engagement. <laughs> Likewise, with President Trump, he is the democratically yeah. elected president of the United States, and we have to engage with him. We live in a country where, thankfully, we have a, 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 a thriving democracy where people are able to express their views and opinions in relation to his policies and approach, and I uh, encourage people uh, to continue to do that. But the idea uh, that we can't engage with him uh, is just fanciful. OK. Uh, John Swinney. I think the biggest problem that I think is emerging for people in a lot of the stuff that Donald Trump is, is talking about and expressing is that it's just far from clear yeah. what on earth he is doing or saying. And I think the, uh, the whole approach, uh, I, I watched a, a little bit of the press conference that, uh, before I came to, to this discussion tonight, and I just couldn't fathom half of what President Trump was on about. Now, I think what, in amongst all that, uh, I worry that there might be a terrible naivety about dealing with very significant and sensitive and difficult issues on the international stage where wise, thoughtful caution is required to decide what's the right thing to do. And I don't think wise, thoughtful caution are words that you would normally associate with Donald Trump. All right. I... There were a wise, thoughtful reaction to a completely different story. Oh, you want a brief word, very brief. Yes, if you're wise British, and thoughtful. Yes, I find British foreign policy very intriguing because we don't like Russia because they're a persecution of gay people, but we love Saudi Arabia, who <laughs> execute yeah, gay right. people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. El El Elizabeth Roddick, Elizabeth Roddick, we have just time to fit this in, please. Should we add vitamin D to food? Should we add vitamin D? And this is the report that came out this very week saying that vitamin D could spare people from getting colds and flu, that in the winter, uh, particularly <coughs> in places like Glasgow where you have shorter days and not much sunshine, 
Vitamin D, according to the professor, should be added, like fluoride was added to the water, as it is in the United States. Do you think it should be added? Uh, Val? Um, I think it probably should in Glasgow, where there is the well-known Glasgow effect, because you have so much cloud. See, I, I live in the east of Scotland, where we get much more sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> but in, 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 in general, I think if it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be harmful to include it in basic food In stuff. milk, like in America. Why not? Mark Little, were you in favour of that intervention? It may or may not be a good idea to include it, but I don't want politicians deciding that we will. You don't you want politicians down, doing anything. Pretty much. What do you, yeah, want? you pretty much nailed <laughs> it right there. Yeah. I don't want politicians doing very much at all. Uh, you pretty much nailed it right there. Look, you can, if you want to buy vitamin D supplements and sprinkle them on your cornflakes, good luck for you. And whether you live on the east side or in Glasgow, go for it. You have, we have more options in our diet today than we have ever right. had before. John Swinney, uh, there's, three... a to, there's a lot to, uh, to, for people to get their heads around if they want to be healthy, but please to God, don't leave this to some panel of it's... experts right, advising right. the health John, John Swinney, would the, would the Scottish Government like to see it put into the milk? put into the food so people, without having to go out and buy supplements, actually got vitamin D? I think the, the issue of adding it to, to foods or to, to materials is, is, a, is I think, a, a, a much more complex question. But what I want to talk about... Is it a moral just, issue? That uh, it's, not a moral it's, issue. it's not a moral issue, but I think it's a, it, it does affect people's rights and their choices, yeah. and that's why we have to be careful here. But let me just share a personal observation with you. My wife, as, as many people in Scotland know, has multiple sclerosis. And the incidence of MS in Scotland is particularly intense. And one of the reasons is viewed to be a vitamin D deficiency. So I'm a big advocate. I take vitamin D supplements every day. My little six-year-old son, he takes them every day as well. My wife takes them. So there is a, there's a big issue about recognising our circumstances here and the need perhaps to take that supplement and to enhance that capability because of our circumstances. But we have to, there's a, it's a different issue about whether that should then be made compulsory. But right. uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very significant point. But it's not well, making it compulsory. No, 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 the woman in the front. It, yes. It's not making it compulsory. Well, it would be if it was in the milk. You don't have to drink the milk. You don't have to drink the milk. Okay. Don't go with that milk. But there are people who can't afford the people who can't afford the private supplement. No, no. Can I say that not everybody actually drinks milk? Vegans uh -huh. don't. Yeah, they, yeah. they do drink other types of milk. And many people would be um, very angry at, the, at supplements being added to their food that may not come from an ethical source or a source that they felt that they could okay. eat or drink. Sh Shami, can you be very quick on this because we're coming towards the I end? I can. Sorry. It's all very well saying leave the politics out. It's all very well saying we'll all spend the money on supplements. What if you can't afford exactly. your food, let alone your supplements? Exactly. That is the biggest problem here, I think. De David Mundell. Uh, well, I'm glad, David, to be able to, to finish the programme by, by being in agreement uh, with John <laughs> Swinney, uh, because I think that, that you know, I, I think John highlights the, the, the really important issues in relation to any addition to food. There are uh, people who would benefit from that, but there are other people who need uh, and should be given the choice, and it's getting the balance right. OK. Time's up. Sorry. <laughs> I know, I know. It's always like that. Particularly in <laughs> Glasgow, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs>